In the ring at this time, Skandar Akbar from Devastation Incorporated presents from Uganda, the Ugandan giant, 397 pounds, Kamala. James Arthur Harris was born May 28, 1950 in the Senatobia, Mississippi and grew up the only male child surrounded by sisters. Tragedy would strike early in life for Harris as he was thrust into being the man of the family at far too young of an age when his father was shot and killed when James was only four years old. Once he was old enough, Harris worked with the family as a sharecropper. Though his mother remarried and relocated the family to the small town of Coldwater, it took the entire family farming a small piece of land to survive. By the time Harris was 13, he did find some happiness playing football where his size and strength helped him excel, but off the field he started to fall in with a rough crowd and began doing some petty theft on the side. After getting caught breaking into a house, Harris was told by a police officer it would be a good idea to leave town. As Harris was a young black man in Mississippi dealing with a white police officer in the 1960s, he took the thinly veiled threat very seriously. Oddly enough, the threat changed his life for the better. Leaving high school in 1968, Harris went to Lake Worth, Florida, where he got a job picking fruits and vegetables for an hourly wage, a considerable step up from relying on the seasonal payouts of farming in Mississippi. Impressing his employers, he was moved into a higher paying position in the packing facility and filled in as a truck driver when he was needed. It was during this time Harris was introduced to professional wrestling for the first time and began attending championship wrestling from Florida shows where he became a fan of Thunderbolt Patterson and the young Dusty Rhodes. While Harris was doing well in Florida, he made a decision that would turn out to change his life forever. Feeling alone in Florida, in 1970 Harris moved to Benton Harper, Michigan where one of his sisters was living with a boyfriend who was a truck driver. Harris began riding in the truck with his sister's boyfriend while hoping to get a job himself. Frustrated that work was coming slowly, Harris jokingly said he should become a professional wrestler. Well, taking him seriously, his sister's boyfriend took him to the home of Bobo Brazil, one of the most famous people in wrestling that happened to live in Benton Harbor. Arriving unannounced, the two were told Brazil was not at home, but his wife directed them to another wrestler named Tiny Tim Hampton. Hampton was impressed with the young 6'7 Harris and convinced Brazil to help train the potential star, but neither Brazil or Hampton smartened him up to the predetermined nature of pro wrestling. While Harris trained with the two stars, preparing as if pro wrestling was a real sporting competition, Harris also helped set up and tear down the ring for house shows in Detroit's big-time wrestling promotion. Though his foot was in the door in pro wrestling, the first winner in Michigan was a rough one for the Mississippi-born Harris, who decided to head south to further his wrestling career. After a short stint in Arkansas, Harris went to Memphis, Tennessee, where he befriended veteran wrestler Mario Gilento, who finally told Harris how pro wrestling actually worked and taught him how to sell moves and make the fans believe what they were seeing was real. By 1978, Harris was under the tutelage of another veteran wrestler and booker, the great Mephisto Frankie Kane, who told him to reuse his football name Sugar Bear in the ring. Early on, Sugar Bear Harris worked primarily as part of the opening match for cards, even after moving on to the Tri-State Territory based in Oklahoma. Harris jobbed the stars like Haystacks Calhoun, Jim Garvin, and B. Brian Blair, though he did get a small push once he entered the Dallas Territory in late 1979. Harris almost immediately wrestled the spoiler for the American Heavyweight Championship, though he did not win the title. Harris also took DQ wins over the likes of Mark Lewin and Gino Hernandez, but still headed back to Memphis and the Continental Wrestling Association by early 1980. Stuck in opening matches and mostly jobbing to the stars, Harris did play a small part in a notable angle in Memphis. Paul Ellering turned on his partner superstar Bill Dundee during a televised tag match, leading to Dundee being pinned by Harris and giving him and partner Bill Smithson the win. Obviously wanting to be more than a footnote in someone else's feud, Harris moved on to the Georgia Territory, 
where he got an even bigger push than the one in Dallas. Using the name Bad News Harris, James won the Southeastern Heavyweight Championship over Ole Anderson on April 25, 1980, holding the title for more than a month before dropping the belt to Terry Taylor on May 6. Despite the higher profile in Georgia, bookers and promoters felt Harris needed more seasoning and improvement on his ring skills. With that in mind, Harris traveled to Europe for a brief run in Germany before heading to England to work on joint promotions where he faced off against British stars like Alan Kirby, Big Daddy, and Wayne Bridges. Working under the names Jim Harris and the Mississippi Mauler, Harris gained a great deal of experience in England and even made it to the finals of a tournament to crown a new WWA World Heavyweight Champion, losing to Bridges in the final match. Suffering a broken ankle, Harris returned home to Mississippi to heal. After recovering, Harris traveled to the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis to visit his friend Troy Graham, who was working in the CWA as the Dream Machine. While waiting on Graham, Harris was approached by CWA co-owner and top star Jerry Lawler, who did not remember Harris from his previous run as enhancement talent in Memphis. Lawler's famous feud with comedian Andy Kaufman had run its course, and he had an idea for a new foe to go up against. Lawler let Harris know he had a spot for him, but said, I'm not looking for a wrestler, I'm looking for a monster. After seeing Lawler's drawings of the vision he had for this new foe and being told his backstory would be that of a former bodyguard for ousted Uganda president Idi Amin, Harris agreed to take on the character that made him a wrestling legend. In May 1982, Kimalo was introduced to Memphis fans through a vignette presented on television as being in the jungles of Uganda though it was actually taped near CWA co-owner Jerry Jarrett's farm in Hendersonville, Tennessee. An intimidating sight with a painted face and entering the ring carrying a spear, Kamala was managed by J.J. Dillon, who was credited for discovering the giant while on excursion to Africa. Kamala was accompanied by his attendant, Friday, originally portrayed by Buddy Wayne and later Frank Dalton. There was no time wasted getting Giant Kamala to the main event as less than a month after his debut, he defeated Lawler for the AWA Southern Heavyweight Championship at the very same Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis. Over the next month, Kamala would tear through some of the other top Memphis talent and title defenses, like Bill Dundee, Stan Lane, and Steve Kern, all while building up to the return match against Lawler. Two months after winning the title from Lawler, Giant Kamala would drop the title back to the King of Memphis, and Harris would run into his first problem with being the unstoppable monster in a territory. Once the monster is defeated, what do you do with him? From a main event feud with the top star in the territory, Kamala had a few meaningless tag matches with partner Rick McGraw before being part of a comedy bid as Stan Frazier was renamed Kamala II. It was part of a running gag that saw Frazier continually changing gimmicks and trying to fit in somewhere. That all led to a brief feud between Kamala and Kamala too, but luckily Harris was already testing the waters in other territories. With brief runs in both Georgia and Florida mixed in with wrapping up his Memphis commitments, which was accompanied with a spelling change, Kamala then moved on to Bill Watts' Mid-South Territory in October of 1982. Harris would later say Watts was the only promoter that paid him fairly. Watts was also the first to give Kamala a proper hard push. Being placed in Skandar Akbar's Devastation Incorporated, Kamala spent the first month of his Mid-South run destroying enhancement talent on television and in spot and house shows. Eventually, Kamala started facing the top talent in the territory, even defeating the popular junkyard dog in Baton Rouge. Rather than a somewhat rushed story to give the territory's top talent a foe to topple in short order, Kamala was being presented as a true unstoppable villain. This all led to a series of matches in early 1983 against the world-famous Andre the Giant. Kamala was still protected in the early matches across Louisiana, Oklahoma, and in Houston, losing, but losing by disqualification to Andre. By April, and with some real serious heat between Harris and Andre, Kamala would lose to the Giant at a big show at the Superdome in New Orleans, but was still considered a threat to anyone not Andre the Giant. This was followed by a series of matches against Junkyard Dog, including title matches for the North American Heavyweight Championship. 
Eventually, it came time to move on. Watts in the Mid-South Territory had a working relationship with Fritz Von Erich's World Class Championship Wrestling. With Skandar Akbar also working in World Class, it was a natural move for Harris to move on to Dallas. Kamala made his World Class debut at the Will Rogers Memorial Center in Fort Worth in a match against Mike Bond on March 28, 1983. While he had some commitments to fulfill with Mid-South, by late April, Kamala was primarily appearing in the Dallas Territory. With a different crowd and a different television audience, Kamala could once again be presented as the unstoppable monster that nobody could see being defeated. After tearing through a few jobbers and mid-carters like Mike Reed and Johnny Mantell, and even a win over the main eventer Chris Adams, it was a natural for Kamala to clash with World Class Wrestling's resident fan favorite monster, Bruiser Brody. The first meeting between Kamala and Brody came at the Independence Day Star Wars card at the Tarrant County Convention Center in Fort Worth on July 4, 1983. The match was everything fans expected from a clash between the two, with Kamala drawing blood from Brody early in the match. Kamala dominated early, but Brody fought back and got cheers from the rowdy crowd for even knocking the Ugandan giant to one knee and eventually flat on his back. The match ended in a chaotic double disqualification, with two different referees being thrown to the ground and wrestlers coming from the back to pull the two apart. Brody and Kamala face each other several times over the next two months, with most matches ending in a double disqualification. The matches included lumberjack matches, one of which Brody won by disqualification, and a Falls Count Anywhere match that Kamala actually won. The violent series of matches left fans wondering if anybody could stop the Ugandan giant. It even led to Kamala getting a match for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship against Harley Race, which Race won by DQ. Arguably being in the highest profile position of his career, it was only natural for Kamala to face off against World Class Wrestling's permanent main event attraction, the Von Erichs. Skandar Akbar's stable had been feuding with Von Erichs for years, and thinking he had the monster that could finally take them down, the devious manager went on the offensive. Kamala attacked David in the middle of a match between Von Erich and Jim Garvin at the Sportatorium. The sneak attack backfired as David fought back and applied the Von Erich Iron Claw to Kamala's head. It was the first time Kamala showed fear as he would then turn away and try to escape any time David even showed the claw. Kamala would go on to face David in a series of matches at spot and house shows, including David's defense of the Texas Heavyweight Championship at the 1983 Thanksgiving Day Star Wars at Reunion Arena in Dallas. Kevin and Kerry would also face off against Kamala, with Kerry accepting a body slam challenge from the Ugandan giant. Kamala would also be in the middle of another feud as Devastation Incorporated clashed with the fabulous Freebirds and have more matches against the visiting Andre the Giant. By the time Kamala faced the Great Kabuki at the David Von Erich Memorial Parade of Champions on May 5th, 1984, his time in world class was coming to an end. Feeling he was underpaid, Harris was ready to move on. After a quick stop in Mid-South and a brief return to Memphis, Kamala had a month-long run in Mid-Atlantic in June and July 1984, facing off against the likes of Dusty Rhodes and Jimmy Valiant. On July 20th, 1984, Kamala began what is unfortunately the part of his career many people think of when they think of Kamala. Harris would later say he loved the Kamala character, but was not a fan of how he was portrayed in the World Wrestling Federation. One of the first looks WWF fans had of Kamala was on Tuesday Night Titans, the kayfabe talk show that aired on the USA Network. Appearing with his new manager Fred Blassie, Kamala was presented as eating a live chicken on set, though the camera cut away without showing the actual consumption and returned to show Kamala with feathers on his face and hands. The segment was symbolic of the cartoony way the WWF intended to present Kamala, a far cry from the man monster that debuted in places like World Class. Once in the ring, Kamala did have some high profile matches, including a match against WWF champion Hulk Hogan. Kamala also had another series of matches against Andre the Giant that culminated in Andre pinning Kamala in a steel cage match at the Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. Harris still felt he was being underpaid, as many WWF wrestlers did at the time, as it was early in Vince McMahon's national expansion push and he was leveraged to the hill. With the cost of living more expensive in the Northeast, Kamala moved on again after just four months. With money a concern, it's no surprise Kamala was back in Mid-South by the beginning of 1985, where he challenged Terry Taylor for the North American Championship, 
and feuded with Butch Reed. While Kamala mostly wrestled in Mid-South, he did travel extensively throughout the year, making appearances in the AWA, St. Louis, Houston, and Japan. There were also matches back in World Class, which included an appearance at the 1985 Memorial Parade of Champions in the wild 3 out of 5 falls, 2 ring, 6 man tag team tornado match, where he partnered with Rip Oliver, Steve Williams, One Man Gang, Chris Adams, and Gino Hernandez against the Von Erichs and the Freebirds. Kamala was not done with the WWF just yet. By the summer of 1986, Kamala was contacted by Andre the Giant and convinced to come back for a series of matches against Hulk Hogan surrounding the WWF Championship. Hoping the money would be better this time around, working in a long program with Hogan, Kamala agreed. Given more of a proper build this time, Kamala returned to the WWF in August of 1986 and ran through a series of enhancement talent and mid-carters before a long series of title matches against Hogan. Between a Christmas night house show in Landover, Maryland and a house show in Joe Louis Arena in Detroit on June 27, 1987, Kamala wrestled Hogan 33 times for the WWF title, including no DQ and steel cage matches. While Hogan and Kamala did have matches at the famed Madison Square Garden, they never headlined a pay-per-view, and Kamala had no match at all at WrestleMania II during that stretch. While main eventing against Hogan, Kamala did receive nice payouts, often as much as $5,000 per match. Once the run against Hogan was over, he was back to making around $1,500 a week while paying all of his travel expenses and a promotion that traveled a lot. Though he would be in some high-profile matches, tagging with Sika and challenging the Hart Foundation for the World Tag Team titles, by the end of 1987, Kamala had moved on again. After taking some independent bookings, the spot opened up to return to Dallas again in what was now the World Class Wrestling Association. Kamala briefly aligned with the new version of the Fabulous Freebirds, often tagging with Iceman King Parsons while facing off against Kevin and Kerry Von Erich, as well as former Freebirds Michael Hayes and Terry Gordy. That brief run came to an end by December of 1988 after Kamala's new partner, the Botswana Beast, portrayed by Ben Peacock, was introduced to World Class fans. After a return to Japan through the summer of 1989, Kamala returned to the U.S. making appearances in smaller promotions around the country and a quick swim through the USWA before heading to Mexico, where he spent the remainder of 1990. Kamala spent most of 1991 in all Japan pro wrestling, coming back to the USWA in November where he reignited his feud with Jerry Lawler. With something of a feeling of things coming full circle, Kamala defeated Jerry Lawler on November 25, 1991 at the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis to win the USWA Unified World Heavyweight Championship. It was the first time under any name James Harris had been recognized as the world champion by any promotion. Kamala would win the USWA World Championship four times, with he and Lawler trading the belt back and forth through the rest of the year and Kamala dropping it to Coco Beware in February of 1992. Kamala would get the belt back from Ware in March, but then lose it a final time to Lawler in April. By this time, the USWA had a working relationship with the WWF, leading to Kamala's third and final run through the New York-based promotion. After a brief feud with Sergeant Slaughter, challenging Randy Savage for the WWF Championship and a series of matches against Intercontinental Champion Bret Hart, Kamala started what might be his most memorable feud for most people with The Undertaker. Following an odd series of matches that put Kamala partnered with Mr. Fuji in a handicap match against The Undertaker, Kamala finally got Taker one-on-one -on -one at the 1992 SummerSlam pay-per-view at Wembley Stadium in London. Undertaker won by disqualification, but according to an unconfirmed claim from Steve Lombardi who portrayed Kamala's handler Kim Chi, the Undertaker won big in the bank account. While Kamala's $13,000 payday was nothing to sneeze at, according to Lombardi, The Undertaker was paid in the neighborhood of half a million dollars. That's likely not true, as the WWF reportedly only made $3.6 million from ticket and merchandise sales combined. Sure or not, Harris believed it, and started getting the same feeling of unfair payment he had before. Kamala finished 1992 with the WWF, mostly jobbing to Ultimate Warrior, Big Boss Man, and reviving his feud with The Undertaker for a casket match at Survivor Series in November. On November 14, 1992, Kamala would actually turn face 
as his manager Harvey Whippleman and handler Kim Chi were starting to mistreat the Ugandan giant. Slick stepped in to help and Kamala turned on Whippleman and Kim Chi. This led to a feud with Kim Chi for several weeks, but also cranked up the cartoony vignettes as Slick tried to teach Kamala things like bowling. Harris didn't like the face turn and thought Kamala worked better as a heel. The turn also didn't lead to much, as aside from beating Kim Chi several times in house shows, Kamala was jobbing the Bam Bam Bigelow and Razor Ramon. A match against Bigelow was set for WrestleMania, but was canceled, meaning despite three runs through the WWF, Kamala never had a WrestleMania match. When it got to the point Kamala was losing to Bastion Booger, Harris knew it was time to move on. It was a rough time personally for Harris, as his sister Hester and niece Chandra were killed. Harris and his wife chose to help raise his surviving niece and decided to leave wrestling to be home more, going back to truck driving. At one point, Harris even made a delivery to Madison Square Garden and had a brief encounter with Vince McMahon, who reportedly didn't recognize him. Kamala did have one more shot at stardom in 1995 when he was brought into World Championship Wrestling as part of Kevin Sullivan's Dungeon of Doom stable. But the run only lasted a few weeks as, once again, his payouts were found to be far less than other wrestlers. A free-spending Eric Bischoff did raise his pay from 500 in appearance to 800, but also gave him fewer dates. Harris left and went back into semi-retirement. Harris would make occasional appearances as Kamala at independence shows and even appeared in the gimmick Battle Royal at WrestleMania in 2001, sort of giving him his WrestleMania moment. On July 20th, 2002, James Harris as Kamala had his final wrestling match, losing to Jerry Lawler at an international wrestling cartel event in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, Harris had severe health problems after his career was over. Harris had been diagnosed with diabetes in 1992, and by 2009 had toes on his left foot amputated due to complications from that and high blood pressure. In 2011, his left leg had to be amputated below the knee. Just four months later, in April of 2012, his right leg was also amputated below the knee. He still managed to support himself, making wooden chairs and also writing a book and selling merch on the website. In August of 2020, Harris tested positive for COVID-19 and was hospitalized. On August 9th, 2020, James Harris went into cardiac arrest and passed away. Upon hearing the news, fans and people in the wrestling industry both came forward with donations to help cover funeral and other expenses. Fans raised more than $30,000 through a GoFundMe page. Impact executive Scott D'Amour donated $2,500, and Chris Jericho donated $5,000. It was a testament to how highly thought of James Harris was, no matter what name they knew him under. Even now, more than 10 years after his death, James Harris, Kamala the Ugandan giant, may be more popular than ever. A man who rose from nothing and walked on the biggest stages of professional wrestling. And away he goes with those vicious Ugandan chops. David. This is not part of a fabulous part that these fans have seen throughout the evening. And Kamala. Threatened by the iron claw and makes a quick exit.